Good afternoon. Uh, sorry for a uh, slight delay. We had some technical issues, but we hope that also people now online are there and that you can follow what will be happening here. Uh, very welcome to uh, NIAS talk. Uh, NIAS is the Netherlands Institute for Advanced uh, Study. Uh, and NIAS talks are events where NIAS fellows present their work. And this afternoon there will be two NIAS fellows who will present. Um, first, Jessica Feldman will present. And Jessica is an assistant professor, or in French, an enseignant chercheuse, in communication, media, and culture at the American University in Paris. Um, and a fellow, indeed, at this moment at uh, NIAS. She researches the political ramifications and potentials of emerging digital technologies, AI, digital security, specifically their capacity to facilitate or repress solidarity and collective self-governance. And she herself will, in a minute, uh, relate her work to the topic she's discussing this afternoon. The second speaker, Eisenhower Korkmas, is also a research fellow at this moment for the full year at NIAS. She earned her PhD from the University of Amsterdam at the Department of European Studies. And her current work focuses on the multifaceted after effects of the Armenian genocide in Soviet and post-Soviet Armenia. She explores how the genocide survivors and their descendants in Armenia have been reflecting on the violent past losses and expulsion from the ancestral homeland. And she will also uh, introduce herself in a more detailed way in a minute. My name is Jan-Willem Duivendak. I'm director of um, NIAS. Um, this afternoon we will discuss anti-Semitism. And since Hamas atrocities on October 7th, we have witnessed a reported rise in anti-Semitism, but also a rise in debates about what exactly anti-Semitism is. And what is, for instance, criticism of Israeli policies? Or are those criticisms actually necessarily anti-Semitic? That, th that are the kind of questions we are going to deal with this afternoon. And obviously, those are very difficult uh, discussions. Given the situation in Israel and Gaza since October 7th, um, and just perhaps one more remark on that. So what do we expect, what kind of discussion do we hope to have this afternoon? Um, we don't want to repeat purely political positions. Those are out there more than enough. We hope to have an academic contribution, but obviously a contribution that is very pertinent for what is going on. Uh, an academic contribution, and then we ask ourselves, what does it help when we clarify concepts, concepts such as anti-Semitism? Um, when does it help when, when we do that? Whom profits from that type of intellectual exercise? And um, we will be doing this, um, and now about the program. Uh, first, by a brief introduction by Jessica for about 20 minutes, then Eisenhower for about 20 minutes, and then we have a Q&A. We start a conversation here, but there will be ample uh, space for you to ask your questions as well. All right, let's get started. Uh, Jessica, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, everyone can hear me okay? Good. All right, we're just sorting the slides. They're very beautiful. <laughs> um, but I, I'll, I'll start anyway. Um, thank you for the introduction, Jan William. Um, and thank you, SPA25, for hosting us, and Jan William and Merlein for moderating this discussion. Um, as Jan William said, it's a sensitive topic and a sensitive moment. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and so we're here to have this talk because we wanted to try to be offering something that's useful and productive, we hope. And um, in an effort to avoid further polarization 
and more successfully combat hate speech in our societies. So we hope to have this conversation in the spirit of collaboration and helpfulness. Um, so I'm Jessica, as Jan Williams said. Um, I'm a research fellow at NIAS. Um, on a personal note, I'm a practicing Jew. I'm from the US. I now live in Europe. So um, for both of us, as Muslim and Jew, this topic is not just professional, but also personal. Um, so uh, let me see. OK. <laughs> what I can say professionally as a communication scholar is that we know that language matters. And the discourse that we use to frame activism, to frame a critique, to frame a conversation, these are political acts. So whether something is a pro-Palestinian protest, whether a pro-Palestinian protest is framed as an anti-war activism or as hate speech makes a big difference in how the action and the idea operates in our society. Um, we're also, neither of us are free speech essentialists, so we believe and we agree that regulating and banning hate speech is a good idea. So our goal tonight is to more precisely and justly define what anti-Semitism is. Um, because we're noticing now the use of the concept of anti-Semitism to quiet criticism of Israel and to silence voices that are not necessarily anti-Semitic, but that look or seem to be advocating for the perspectives of Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim life. So what we're going to speak about today is why it is dangerous and counterproductive to conflate anti-Semitism with all criticism of Israel, both for Jews and for others, especially for Arabs, Muslims, and Palestinians. And um, we want to emphasize that uh, it's particularly dangerous right now in a Europe that is increasingly moving to the far right, increasingly Islamophobic, increasingly polarized, and actually has increasing incidents of actual anti-Semitism, which we need to be able to address. So, uh-oh. <laughs> it went away. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just keep talking. Um, they're not that great, actually, my slides. <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, I wanted to give a little context. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, um, give a little context about what's been happening lately. Um, probably a lot of you know this, so sorry if I'm repetitive. Um, so several European governments, including Germany, France, Austria, Switzerland, and Hungary, have restricted pro-Palestinian protests. In France, in France it's called a protest supporting the Palestinian cause, um, or have a blanket ban on them altogether. Um, also concerningly, uh, cultural events featuring Palestinian voices, sometimes completely unrelated to the conflict, have been suddenly canceled or postponed. So um, one case here among many, uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair canceled an award ceremony for a Palestinian author pictured here. She was to receive an award for a novel she had written based on a true story of the rape of a Bedouin girl by an IDF officer. And uh, they stopped the ceremony. There are num numerous other examples. Um, so these cancellations, these events, had very little to do with the current war, but told stories that lifted up and humanized Palestinian perspectives. And some of the bans and the cancellations of the protests, which criticized Israel or supported Palestinians, were labeled as security threats and either as anti-Semitic or as inciting anti-Semitism. Um, so this is very vague and hard to prove. And it draws, uh, often the, these EU states draw on a working definition of anti-Semitism that has been endorsed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance that is easily interpreted to conflate Jews in Israel. So I want to discuss that definition and an alternate definition that is more precise and we think could be more helpful. Um, Oh, also, <laughs> I need to say, it's important. Uh, we're not the only ones to say this. Um, in fact, we're not the first ones to say this. There are many other people who've been writing open letters. Articles have been published, many opinion pieces recently, before and since October 7th, which discuss why it's problematic to conflate anti-Semitism and critiques of Israel. 
um, and particularly talk about this IHRA definition of anti-Semitism as problematic. Um, so two kind of salient examples. Um, Masha Gessen in The New Yorker just wrote a very long piece on this topic a week ago. In fact, their Hannah Arendt Prize has now been revoked by Germany because of that piece. Um, and here in the Netherlands, Yolanda Janssen and Hila Diane uh, published a long piece on this topic in September in the Dutch Review of Books. Um, I recommend them both. So we've all been talking about this definition uh, from the IHRA. And I just want to explain it, basically. Um, so it was first introduced by the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia in 2005, and then endorsed by the IHRA in 2016 as a legally non-binding guideline for governments and institutions. Um, and it's kind of clear that they're talking about this as a draft. Like, it's short, it's not very precise, it's not supposed to be legally binding, but it has become like the touchstone for most European governments when they define anti-Semitism. Um, so this is the language that it uses. Uh, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. So uh, it all sounds true, um, but it's also rather unclear what this certain perception is characterized by, what these rhetorical and physical manifestations might be. Um, and so the definition uh, goes on to offer examples and the first example, the first example is the targeting of the state of Israel, conceived as a Jewish collectivity. Um, and I was totally confused by this at first because I don't know who is doing the conceiving, um, whether it's the definition, the anti-Semite, Israel itself, everyone in the world. Um, we don't know, and because we don't know, it can be deployed politically in a lot of different ways. Um, so it seems, based on the following sentence, that what is meant is that criticism of Israel, because it is seen as Jewish, is anti-Semitic, while other criticisms of Israel, because it's a badly behaved nation state, are not anti-Semitic. But this is not at all how the definition has been used. OK, and that might be because they offer then some further examples. I don't know if you can read them or if the print is too small, um, but I'll just sort of focus on a few. Um, so some of them are like classic, clear examples of anti-Semitism, violence against or killing of Jews, dehumanizing or stereotyping Jews as a collectivity, uh, particularly conspiracy theories that Jews run the world, control the media and the economy, if only, um, denying the scope and the fact of the Holocaust, etc. Um, so the parts that uh, cause difficulty have to do with some of the language around Israel, which can be interpreted and has been interpreted to shield it from criticism. Um, for example, when the Israeli government, like many nation states, rules or acts in racist ways um, or levels mass violence against entire populations, as nation states do, and it is always horrible and always needs to be criticized. Um, but it becomes difficult to criticize it when uh, we have this language saying that it is anti-Semitic to call Israel a racist state. Um, so it's, it's become a much bigger problem since October 7th. And uh, part of the problem here, I would say, is that there are no counterexamples of what kinds of discussions on Israel are not necessarily anti-Semitic, and that perhaps is intentional. Um, so what we wanted to propose um, and offer here is to introduce this alternate definition of anti-Semitism, which is called the G uh, Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. Uh, so this was authored in 2021. Uh, so what happened was in Jerusalem, a bunch of 
Holocaust, genocide, anti-Semitism scholars, Israel scholars, Palestine scholars, Middle East studies scholars all got together to write an alternate definition to improve upon or respond to the IHRA definition and to offer much more precise examples specifically regarding Palestine and Israel. Um, so this definition is not adopted by EU states, but is currently signed by over 350 international experts from related fields. Um, so this defines anti-Semitism as uh, discrimination, prejudice, hostility, or violence against Jews as Jews, or Jewish institutions as Jewish. Um, and let me go on here. So it gives some general guidelines for identifying anti-Semitism. So these include making sweeping judgments and racist essentializing about Jews, advocating the idea that all Jews are linked to forces of evil wealth and secret power, assaulting someone because they are Jewish, swastika graffiti, particularly on gravestones and synagogues, um, refusing to hire or promote someone because they are Jewish, engaging in coded messaging against Jews, so things like the Rothschilds run the world, Israel is the ultimate evil, as if there is an ultimate evil, um, denying or minimizing the Holocaust. Um, and then it goes on to give examples of discussions on Israel and Palestine that on the face of it, wait, hold on. Yes, are anti-Semitic. <laughs> We're starting with that one. Um, OK, so to apply classical negative stereotypes of anti-Semitism to Israel. And we just went through those. Um, to blame all Jews for its actions, as if Israel speaks on behalf of all Jews. To demand that Jews condemn Israel because they are Jewish, for example, in a political meeting. On the other side of the coin, I would like to say, like similarly, it is Islamophobic to demand that all Muslims condemn Hamas because they are Muslim. Um, to deny Jews in Israel the, the right to exist and flourish as Jews in accordance with the principle of equality. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, still there. And I, I wanted to stay here. I, I know there are some scholarly voices also who even uh, reject this definition because it brings Israel in and uh, doesn't do enough, particularly in that last point, to separate. It, they, they claim that that point also protects Israel. Um, I, I'm not sure about that, uh, but I want to mention those perspectives. OK, so this is the part that they added. Um, so examples that, on the face of it, are not anti-Semitic. Uh, to support the Palestinian demand for justice and rights, evidence-based criticism of Israel or its conducts in the West Bank and Gaza, to oppose Zionism as a form of nationalism. If you happen to be opposed to nationalism, you might be opposed to Zionism to support arrangements that accord full equality to all inhabitants from the river to the sea, regardless of the form of state. Um, OK. So um, I think also the on the face of it is important in both of these cases, um, because it can be the case that someone holds these opinions because they are anti-Semitic or engages in an enemy of my enemy kind of thinking because Israel has been seen as conflated with all forms of Judaism. And I don't want to diminish the fact that that happens. <laughs> However, it is not necessarily anti-Semitic. And calling it anti-Semitic, I think, uh, poses a grave threat, both to Jews and to Muslims, Palestinians, and Arabs. So we're going to speak a little bit more about the danger of this conflation now. Uh, so I'll make a few points, and then I'm going to turn it over here. Um, so the first point is the obvious one. Um, this criticism of anti-Semitism can shield Israel from legitimate uh, critique, which is very necessary right now um, in a moment when it is probably committing a lot of war crimes <laughs> and uh, subject to a, a number of allegations that are very serious. 
so this critique is needed for the protection of the human rights of the victims of Israel's violence. Okay. Um, secondly, and I want to elaborate on this one a little more, is the idea that uh, Israel does not stand for Jewishness. And there's a broader idea here uh, that it's dangerous to conflate entire ethno-religious groups with any single polarized and right now warring position. Um, so this implies that Netanyahu government is defending Jewishness itself and, it, and that anyone who supports the Palestinian cause supports Hamas and is anti-Jewish. So this is really dangerous. Um, first, it assumes that Israel's actions are taken on behalf of Jewishness and that criticizing Israel is then hateful towards what Judaism ontologically is. So this idea then implies that it is the Jewishness of Israel that is the author of its actions. It would then be this Jewishness that is to be held responsible for Israel's war crimes. This is anti-Semitic and dangerous for Jews. Um, or as one of my young friends said to me over dinner the other night, the problem is that if it is said to be anti-Semitic to criticize Israel, and it makes sense to criticize Israel, then it starts to make sense to be anti-Semitic. I think that's a less academic and clearer way of saying it. So this is really dangerous. Um, if the two are packaged together. All right, thirdly, and then I'm gonna be done. Um, Jews should get to define themselves. So conflating Jews with Israel also robs Jews of the right to define themselves by forcing them into an either or position vis-a-vis -vis Israel's actions. So even if you're just critical of killing of civilians, you have to spend a lot of time and energy speaking against Israel as a Jew, making clear that you're not Islamophobic or anti-Arab or anti-Palestinian, not necessarily because you're even critical, but because you're assumed to be complicit. Um, and that's not fair. Okay, so that's what I had to say. I'm gonna now hand the baton to Aishiner, and she's going to speak a bit more about the consequences this has for Islamophobia, particularly in Europe. Thank you, Jessica. Um, everybody hears me well? Good. Um, I wanna thank um, Jan Willem, Marlene, um, for setting this up for us. We've been working for almost a month to actually wrap our heads around the conflict and definitions of anti-Semitism. Um, and we have actually decided not to include the Nexus Task Force definition because it's also somehow similar to the Jerusalem Declaration. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the other side of the coin. Um, again, nevertheless, a conflation, but um, I will talk about how conflating Hamas with all Palestinians and pro-Palestinians undermines the safety of those living in Gaza and also actually sometimes West Bank. And in Europe, it actually stokes the flames of xenophobia and Islamophobia. And I want to start with October 7, because when Hamas attacked sudden Israel, killing 1,200 Israeli civilians and taking 240 others hostage, which was the biggest attack on a Jewish community ever since the Holocaust, right? The world descended into a binary paradigm. One either had to be on the side of the Netanyahu government and contextualize the siege of Gaza and the collective punishment of Gazan civilians as Israel's right to defend itself, or one had to be pro-Hamas and an anti-Semite, um, hailing the slaughter on October 7 as an act of victory or decolonization. In my opinion, the killing of the Palestinian um, civilians and the Israeli civilians have nothing to do with self-defense or decolonization. But unfortunately, in the world that we live right now, in the paradigm of rigid either-or fallacies, either-or choices, the search for an understanding of complexity seems to be in vain and nuances that have existed before, 
potential histories that have existed before are somehow out the window. This leaves us with entrenched, entrenched positions. And there are serious consequences of this, as we can see in the case of the Israel-Hamas war, but also we have seen it in the context of the 9-11. Conflations are dangerous because they reduce diverse groups of people into single homogenized, and as Jessica said, warring parties. They create a mindset of us and them, and they leave no space for those who actually don't want to be involved in the us or the them. They also lead to dehumanization. When those homogenized, seemingly homogenized entities are dehumanized, it becomes easier to justify violence against them. And they are seen as less deserving of the basic rights or the dignity that is given to a human life. And finally, when conflations take control of debates of governments or their policies, state policies or military actions, this has entire consequences for societies. And I want to give Gaza as a case in point because Gazans are suffering a collective punishment because some voted for Hamas in 2006. And after that, elections were canceled. This doesn't seem to be figuring into the understanding of Gazans. Not here, not in Israel, not in the US. In fact, the former head of Mossad was speaking to Anderson Cooper on CNN about how they are going to operate in Israel. And um, he first said that they're not targeting non-combatant population. And then he backed on and said, actually, there is no such a thing called non-combatant non population in the Gaza Strip because all of the population had voted for Hamas. <sighs> Gaza has one of the youngest populations in the world with roughly half of the population being under the age of 18. So this means that Gazans were not even born at the time there was once an election in 2016. Another important thing, if we actually move to a more contemporary period, is the fact that up until October 7, Hamas was deeply unpopular in Gaza. Not because of you know, not because people liked Israel all of a sudden or anything, but because it was deeply futile. It didn't really operate for the lives of Palestinians who were in, in uh, the Gaza Strip. And we know this from polls. The Washington Institute operated um, uh, on the ground in uh, July, uh, trying to gather polls, opinions, uh, from people and imagine in an authoritarian setting, how is it that a population decides to give you their real opinion, right? So you also have to keep that in mind. But a few important polls actually demonstrated that almost more than half of Palestinians were not happy with Hamas before October 7. An example is the survey by um, Professor Amane Jamal and her team from the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. And it says that before the war, 67% of Palestinians in Gaza had little or no trust in Hamas. And I also want to remind you that in July and August, there were protests against Hamas. These protesters a few thousand who were brave enough to go out there and protest against the, um, the economic deprivation that they were, uh, the malfunction that they were experiencing, were crushed by the Hamas police and uh, army officers in just a matter of hours, actually. Hundreds were taken into custody and beaten up on the streets. And these videos that are out there didn't even reach to us. When we were researching it, actually, we realized, oh, 
Palestinians do not seem to did not seem to support Hamas. Um, and imagine we are scholars who study violence, who study uh, cultural studies, who study um, hate speech, hate acts, and we didn't also know much about it. So doing research actually really, really helped uh, wrapping our heads around it. I want to talk about Europe a little bit also, because I believe that conflations um, have affected lives and political stances in Europe. Jessica mentioned just a few um, by Adania Sibli, um, actually having no connection whatsoever to a protest, but getting canceled in Germany. And there were other uh, cases also who, um, other people who didn't have anything to do um, with the, uh, the, the conflict at all, in that they had a movie, a book, uh, that they needed to present um, at a uh, broadcast television network or uh, a book fair, and they saw their events canceled. A good example is um, by um, uh, Nathan Thrall, I think, uh, Abed Salama, the book um, about a Palestinian family living in uh, the West Bank. Um, <clears throat> I also want to talk about the cases that were anti-Semitic overtly. In activism, I do not mean to say that all and every activism that criticizes Israel um, by nature cannot be anti-Semitic. We actually saw the case of the Palestinian prisoner solidarity network, Sami Dun, celebrating on the streets of Berlin and um, um, delivering candy to strangers um, in the immediate aftermath of the October 7 attack. And Sami Dun was rightfully um, shut down by the German government. But at the same time, like Jessica said, I do not think it's fair to uh, shut down entire peaceful groups simply because there is a fear of anti-Semitism. There has to be a place, a, sim a simple place for us all to voice concerns about a nation state um, um, basically um, not doing things that it, it, should, it should do, complying with the international law and the criminal law. And in the midst of this restriction wave in Europe, um, we have also seen anti-Palestinian sentiments evolve into a broader anti-immigrant, anti-Arab, and anti-Muslim stances. Migrant communities from the Middle East, often Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, who voice opposition to Israel's policies have been cast as potential carriers of anti-Semitism. Right-wing outlets in Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Austria termed Muslim immigrants as a threat to the country's democracy and values. They linked them clearly with hate and anti-Semitism. Many center-right and far-right politicians joined this furor. For example, actually in Germany, the Christian Democratic Union Party the head of it, Friedrich Merz, argued that Germany cannot take any more refugees. We have enough anti-Semitic young men in the country. Far-right European parties have been using Merz's narrative for so long, and often as a moral cover for their vilification of Muslim immigrants. Since October 7, these views gained more attraction. Germany's IFD, which is now the second largest party in the state elections, quickly went on to demand measures against imported anti-Semitism from Muslim immigrants. In France, the national rally of Marine Le Pen. In Italy, the League of Matteo Salvini. In the Netherlands, the future prime minister of Geert Wilders have exploited the conflict in a xenophobic and Islamophobic direction.
Such right-wing European parties absolve themselves of the responsibility of truly addressing anti-Semitism when it arises as a homegrown hate, and instead they blame it on outsiders. And I want to conclude here that this undermines the safety of both European Jews and European Muslims. Because these positions, these false dichotomies, are ideological fodder for genocide, pitting two groups against each other as if one's survival and flourishing depends on the destruction of the other. Looking back through history at the Holocaust, but also the Armenian, Rwandan, and Bosnian cases, we see this over and over again. It is precisely this type of thinking that we must be careful to avoid right now. European leaders and institutions must correctly and responsibly define what anti-Semitism is and maybe consider the Jerusalem Declaration um, in order not to conflate Jews with Israel, Palestinians with Hamas, and any other pro-Palestinian voice with Hamas. And if they do not do this, they will continue to risk stoking the rising flames of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for those two very necessary contributions, clarifying uh, concepts that are used and abused all the time. Um, reading at least the Dutch newspapers, I think that indeed Many people will think that the war is a war between Jews and Palestinians, whereas you emphasize that it is a war between Israel as a nation state and uh, Hamas. Um, I think what you showed is that uh, at least now this evening for anti-Semitism, um, that it is very important to be extremely precise in what it is meaning and the consequences of the way it's used. Um, I can also imagine that there are terms that one should not use at all, perhaps. So not using it in a very precise way, but avoiding certain terms, particularly in a scholarly context. Before I, I open the floor, uh, open it to the floor, can you perhaps give examples of terms you think that are not very helpful uh, to use in order to understand the ongoing conflict? Can I start with you? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, scholarly, um, our job is easier. We are doing something entirely um, scientific, like academic, and so we can evade. Um, one thing that I want to say, um, we refrained from using the word genocide because, I mean, w we didn't really feel com comfortable with the politicization of it, maybe. But this doesn't mean that genocide in Israel is not happening. We simply did not want to focus on it. We're doing something um, entirely different, almost like creating a tool for um, a public that can voice criticism, that can voice opposition in a constructive way, right? And so we didn't want to go into debates what whether the Hamas attack was a, a genocidal massacre or whether what Israel is doing is a genocide, because that's an entirely different debate, I think. But the collective punishment, I think, is, is a very good term because it's not yet politicized. I really like that term for that matter. And it does the job because um, it, it, in a way it conveys that a, an entire population that um, you know, lives under a regime, uh, an authoritarian one, can actually be conflated with that uh, 30,000 Hamas um, officers, right? Um, and in numbers also, it's like incredibly um, disproportionate. Um, but that's why we didn't use the G word. I was indeed hinting at that. Um, you also can give an example, perhaps otherwise I have a more precise question. 
if that's okay. Um, because I think um, what Eisenhower is introducing is indeed extremely important that uh, if possible um, to have uh, in scholarly work different terms, so for the category of analysis and the category of practice. Uh, and in that sense, the collective punishment is a term that has not been politicized in, in the way genocide and oral terms have been and are used in that way. Um, in the discussion about uh, where you presented um, what is Semitic, uh, anti-Semitic, what is not anti-Semitic, um, there were various examples um, and one of the examples was, uh, but there it was used, I think, in a different way than it is often used uh, during demonstrations, from the river to the sea. Uh, and I was a bit struck by that, because it was meant to be that it's, the land should be for everybody, but using that term, I think, already might evoke a lot of ideas about who has the right to exist or who has not the right to exist. So I was just struck by that was in one of the analysis. Can you perhaps elab elaborate on that? Yeah, I will try. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this term, because um, I, I tried to research the history of this phrase a little bit. Um, my understanding is that it's been used uh, since the 1990s as a claim for Palestinian equality. Um, but it's also been, it's, it is like such a loaded term right now. Uh, so what I w the way I interpret it in the JDA and the way I can imagine it is that this is, this is a demand for equal rights and freedom of movement for all the people who live on this piece of land, right? And um, so this is not calling for destruction, right? This is calling for equal rights uh, if this takes the form of a one-state solution, the name of that state might change from the name that exists right now. I don't see this as destroying Israel or destroying Jews. Okay, that's how I understand the phrase and how I imagine the definition understands the phrase. Um, the phrase was indeed used heavily by Hamas in its campaigning and has been co-opted many times by groups that are in fact anti-Semitic. Um, and so then we have a question now of whether we use the term or whether we use a phrase. Um, and I know we talked about it, <laughs> that uh, maybe it's not productive to use this because it polarizes people and we need to find different language to describe equal rights for all people in this region, between the river and the sea. <laughs> it's also important to note, uh, one of the things that I read um, was that, so this, this chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, it does not rhyme in Arabic. <laughs> so <laughs> it was designed for Western people to say. Um, I don't know what the goal is there, but I, I think it's interesting to keep in mind that uh, this is sort of a fight that we're having in Europe and the US. Um, and the phrase has also been used against uh, the Palestinian cause by Israel. Um, Israel has also made the same claim for its rights to take over this land. Um, so whether or not we should say this, I will say personally, I have attended protests. All my friends around me have said it and I don't say it because it's too close to Hamas right now for me emotionally. But it's not that I don't agree with the intent that I imagine it has. <laughs> um, so I think it's very, very charged right now. Uh, uh, and coming back to that, if possible, not to use those very loaded terms in scholarly work, right? I mean, you were just describing a demonstration, but in scholarly work, and also what you said at the start, that you both of you really want to fight against hate speech. And I think that that expression will be experienced, at least by some people, as hate speech, right? So, it, of course, the question is who is experiencing it and who is expressing it. Um, but if you are opposing hate speech, yeah, there, therefore I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, like at what point does it get so co-opted that it becomes hate speech, yeah. I guess, is the question. And then who gets the right to re-co-opt it and use it? Um, I don't have the answer. No, no, no. That, that, that's okay. <laughs> I think it's a very, very charged uh, phrase right now, and so we have to be very careful with it because it's very hard to use it without it signifying a position. 
We are opening it up to the audience. Just to remind you, no long statements, but really questions for the people who presented, right? Um, and Merlijn will look around who wants, can I have a view who wants to participate in the discussion so we know how many people, about how many people will raise questions? That's very okay. doable. So let's start, Merlijn, there are three people here. To, yeah, he keeps the phone. Oh, my the name mic. is uh, yeah. Tagrid Al Khudari. I'm a journalist. Um, thank you so much. Uh, very enlightening uh, discussion. But I find it extremely uh, hard to understand why a kind of you are try, trying hard to avoid um, diagnosing the issue very bluntly, for example, when it comes to Hamas, as if it's, you know, like the issue is Hamas is an enemy and therefore blah, blah, blah. But Hamas is, is an outcome of the failure of policies. And, and if we don't say it in such way and, and the practices that are happening right now will lead to its kind of, you know, I'm trying, as a journalist, I'm interviewing many people who are fleeing Gaza now and also inside. And at the same time, it's not like nothing can justify something you are also trying to avoid. Genocide, according to, like if you go to the, the definition of genocide by the United Nations, it's unfolding. We are seeing it, you know, like with images, everything, with the personal accounts. So I find it kind of disturbing as a journalist, as an analyst, that you are uh, trying very hard to stay away from that and let's focus, you know, but ca how can you explain uh, it to me? I mean, I'm okay. sorry for that. No, no, so the question is, could you restate or elaborate on the why you are avoiding diagnose the diagnosis? Diagnose yeah. The is, okay. is Maria's question related? Because then, yeah, okay. I mean, uh, Maria Kunov, I'm uh, a fellow at NIAS at the moment. So, um, I, w I mean, I build on Tahrid's point, but actually from a neater perspective. For me, your endeavor is actually quite noble in the sense that you want to redefine the discussion. And in that redefinition of the discussion, I want to know who would be the actors that you would see as being brought on board for a collective discussion that also eventually bring other issues on the table, which are about longer term resolutions. I mean, you mentioned that with the statement of from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, right? How do you resolve the long term issues? So, but who are the actors who in that kind of world that you are trying to really kind of clear up the mess and clear up the fog? Who would be the actors who would participate in that discussion that is more bringing up everybody on board and finding real solutions? Quite some questions. Um, we start with Eisenhower, is it okay? Because I'm a genocide studies scholar, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> authority has been given to me. Um, simply the reason why we didn't study it here doesn't mean that we don't have opinions about it. Um, I mean, um, two answers. One, the concept of genocide um, has been criticized by our scholars for so long, for so many different cases uh, of, uh, of genocides or other types of mass killings because it wasn't enough to define certain political groups that were exterminated. It excluded um, um, you know, certain uh, victim groups from being uh, eligible for this uh, crime, this mass crime. That's the first reason. So we as scholars of genocide are skeptical of the term genocide, especially the way that it is legally used. Um, simply, you know, to give you an example, the Syrian state um, oppressing its own populations doesn't get to be called a genocide. 
um, or Khmeruj, uh, you know, a clear case of political uh, extermination, um, um, doesn't get to be called genocide because political groups are not included. So that's one. We are skeptical of the of the term. Second, um, this isn't to deny the massive scale of violence that has unfolded in Gaza right now. It's nothing comparable to the 2014 war. It's not even comparable to the, uh, to the 70s and, the, and to the 60s, not in terms of casualties, not in terms of the fact that um, Israel used to actually warn civilians by um, the, the warheads, and it doesn't anymore. By the genocidal language, if you will, if, you will, if we would use the, um, the intent argument of the convention, it can be very well argued that it is there. But it's simply not we, what we are doing here. It's a practical thing that we are not doing here. That's, that's the only reason. Okay, so the question is, why not call it a genocide? And um, who are the actors who can resolve the longer-term issues? Um, so actually, to bring on board in a process, I think it's more balanced way. Yeah. Perhaps there is also there the question that uh, the clarification of these concepts is very useful, but not just for scholarly use, I guess, right? So why are you doing this? Might it be yeah. helpful for policymakers or for other actors to use uh, or to better use some of these terms? Yeah, yeah. What's okay, so what's for? the point in clarifying this definition? Yeah. Okay, so maybe I can speak better to that. I will say that I think Netanyahu has expressed genocidal intent. And uh, I think one of the things, because we were speaking about this on the way over with another colleague uh, that bothers scholars in the field of genocide studies, I think I am not in this field, is the way that word is um, used to force people to agree with you. Um, so it, it, and for that reason, they are very, very careful about using the word. Um, but I think it, 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 we're getting there, <laughs> you know. So I, I don't want to deny what's happening. Um, I don't think anyone wants to deny what's happening. Okay, speaking to why clarify this definition. Um, for me, I think there are two reasons. Okay, so one is like because people need to be able to criticize Israel and we need a public discussion about what, ter what type of criticism is permissible. Um, so that's, that was clear. And that, like these people can be activists, but these people can also be scholars. Um, I think a lot of our colleagues have felt uh, quieted in this time. Um, and these people can be political, you know, governments, the EU, you know, political actors who are in the position of having to take a position. Um, the other reason I think is more, you know, I, I have been involved in activism and organizing and I think internally we have to do some work and have a clear understanding of um, what anti-Semitism is, what sexism is, like all of the things that groups on the left work against, we have to continue working against it. Um, and it's very hard to talk about it if we don't have the language to describe it. And if the only language we have available is language that is counter to our purposes, uh, it's not good enough. So we need better definitions. Aizen, you want to add something regarding this last question about why it's so important to have these very clear categories, concepts? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm thinking. Um, because um, in such a polarized um, climate right now, it's um, anything and everything gets conflated. It, you know, Israel and Jewishness gets conflated, and Hamas and Palestine or pro-Palestinians 
the idea of Palestine gets conflated, uh, and then anti-Semitism gets conflated with uh, criticism of Israel. Like, there's really so much confusion. It's almost like this um, layers that we need to tackle. And the other thing, um, a clear definition, a better definition uh, of anti-Semitism than what IHRA offers, is because we are seeing the effects of it post October 7. I mean, they always said the IHRA is legally non-binding, but it's certainly not the case because um, more than 200 governments, most of them European governments, uh, city councils, universities, they actually s like submit to it and they, they can actually start procedures based on it. Um, so accusing Israel as a state, it said. Um, what does it even mean? A accusing Turkey as a state, is it Islamophobic? If we attack Erdogan uh, for its human rights abuses in Eastern Anatolia against Kurds, are we then, Angela Merkel then is very Islamophobic, right? Because she'd been opposing for such a long time. So, you know, accusing a state of crimes based on evidence is just simply not anti-Semitic. That's what we disagree with, basically. Right. There was a question there. Ido, and then there are two more people to the left, to the left here, <laughs> there. Uh, Ido de Haan, uh, historian from Utrecht. Um, I have a question about, about positionality. Um, so uh, one of the, uh, uh, the problems of the uh, HRI definition is uh, uh, conflating uh, a criticism of Israel and, and, and anti-Semitism. So the, uh, the, the, you might say, the problem there is the, the preoccupation with Israel to talk about that all the time. And one of the things that I, I, I to, to, to give an example of positionality, I had for quite a long time the feeling, well, I cannot bring it up to keep on being interested in Israel anymore. It's really, I'm, I'm completely fed up with it. And I think the, the response to the Hamas attack was also, well, they, they managed to get it back into the picture. People lost their interest, basically, in the whole issue. At the same time, that is the problem, that people they give such a load on that whole conflict and it's, it's, it's overloaded with all kinds of things. And one of the reasons I guess it's, it's irresolvable is because it's so overloaded. And so the question is, how do we talk about something that we better not talk about? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so how do we talk about something we don't talk about? Because when we talk about Israel, we talk about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, and is, is this what you mean? And so like uttering that word is like the, bringing up this whole history. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think these definitions are useful, you know, um, to, to kind of uh, de discharge some of, um, some of that aura. Um, in, in what sense? So the, the moment we have the definition that is not linking Jewishness to the Israeli state, therefore then it, you're, less obs you're not necessarily obsessed by Israel, right? So that can be a way to say why one definition is a better one than the other, because it is about anti-Semitism at large and not at all or not necessarily linked to Israel. Yeah. Whereas the other does that all the time. Yeah. Sorry for answering. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so I think also, um, I don't know. I am not very attached to nation states in general. <laughs> so, and I, I think that a lot in many cases it's completely possible to criticize 
a country for its actions. And uh, we need to take that position regarding Israel. Uh, why? why do you think you need to do that? Oh. And we, uh, who's the we then, right? Is yeah, that we yeah, Jewish we people or? People uh, who care about humanity. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, but so why is it so necessary to be able to talk about Israel? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. More, more so necessary than other s states? Or yeah. other conflicts? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think th there's a problem that we don't talk about other conflicts. I think what's happening in Sudan is an incredible uh, catastrophe that has been completely washed over by what's happening right now in Gaza. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Eisenhower, and then we go to the other last questions. Um, it's a difficult question, Edo, I think. Um, but I, I, I thought about it for a long time because two weeks before October 7, Nakarno Karaba was emptied of 120,000 ethnic Armenians. Yes, an enclave, but nevertheless, they were settlers there. They were, you know, they were inhabitants there for decades since the Soviet period. And it didn't make the headlines of BBC, of any other place. So I'm not denying that there is almost a hierarchy of different agonies of different nations. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if it is simply because the attention isn't there for the Central Republic of Africa or Congo or Sudan. Um, we should diminish the support when it actually arises like this um, for a population of two million in a strip. Um, the other thing, I think, the conflict is longer than any other conflict. Um, it has been on and off, on and off for such a long time, and there hasn't been any solution to it. Other conflicts in Africa, yes, they, you know, sometimes they erupt, but they're, I mean, not more than three, four decades. This is almost, you know, within two decades, it's gonna be a hundred years. So um, there is a lot of out migration this displacement of the Nakba that actually formed uh, diaspora here. And diasporas, as we know, they're always politically um, um, aligned with one another and um, they organize. Um, and that's why I think there is really so much attention in Europe. Um, you won't get a full answer now, but... Uh... There are three people, four there, and then the final question here. Yeah, so we go to the middle here of the fourth row. Yes. Should I stand or? Okay. Hi, thank you. Yeah, uh, so my name is. An no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, my name is Anastasia Vivanco Carnevari. I'm a PhD candidate uh, here at the university in social psychology. And my question is directed to Asenur, if possible. Uh, as you mentioned, oh, before I forgot to say, thank you for organizing this and um, very insightful presentation and talk. So my question is about uh, what you mentioned briefly about uh, decolonization as a criticism. Because, um, yeah, I would like to know if you could reflect a bit on what you mean and how it's not, I understood that maybe it's not helpful to look at it as a colonial problem, yeah. And one more question, the person sitting next to her, yes. Yeah, also thank you very much for the discussion. My name is Huub von Baer. I'm a professor in minority and migration studies at Leuven University. I was just wondering, um, you know, I'm very sympathetic to uh, redefining and rethinking the definition of anti-Semitism. I think this is, in general, uh, uh, very important to redefine anti-group uh, racisms. 
Um, but I was wondering what exactly do you consider your target audience? Because um, if we focus on the Western-centric uh, Western uh, discussion, I see actually within the public debates, even in the Netherlands, a lot of different layers of discussing this issue. And I just returned from the Czech Republic where you see a very pro israeli position. But for instance, when you look at, at Spain or, or Portugal or Ireland, very critical about uh, the Israeli government. And also at my own university in Leuven, there's even a call for um, uh, stopping the contacts with, um, with uh, Israeli universities. So you see a lot of, I think, um, if you try to refine the public debate, a lot of different debates, even within Europe or, uh, you know, in, in the Western world. So, who do you consider your target audience when you want to redefine um, or rethink and reconsider the definition of anti-Semitism? Thank Thanks. So, one question for Eisenhower and one for Jessica, I think. Um, Eisenhower, perhaps first, the first question regarding the use of decolonization. Um, so, what I mean by killing civilians is not about decolonizing um, the Gaza Strip or the West Bank, is that if you're going to justify it that way, then you're kind of blocking any other way of decolonizing. Um, because it's not only like in the history of um, um, colonial uh, conflicts or decolonization processes. There had been um, also understandings of peaceful protests or, um, uh, I mean, simply what um, the Palestinian um, activists have been doing outside of um, Israel, sometimes is inside um, in the uh, uh, the occupied territories, sometimes the Israeli Jewish activists are uh, actually really doing so much work to um, uh, counter the Israeli government um, is another way, is an alternative way to actually decolonize. So I don't really, um, I don't really think it's useful to actually you know bring out a massacre of civilians who are not related to they're not like officials or anything even that would be a huge stretch in my opinion um, so it doesn't really justify uh, if there is a um, an imperative of decolonizing maybe this shouldn't be it you know um, that's that would be my answer and then the target audience. Yeah, I think it's somewhat similar to what Maria was asking about. I mean, when we've been writing about this, we've been saying this is our message to EU leaders. Um, I think it might fall on deaf ears <laughs> uh, after the elections here. Um, but I don't know, maybe not in Spain. And it seems to be that uh, the parties that have been acting against these protests and these um, cultural events uh, are the ones that need to be addressed. I also think that, uh, that within activism, we need to have clear definitions as well. All right, last round of questions. So there's one person there and one person here. I think those are the two last. So the woman in the middle, well, that's a bit fake, but. Must be you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, my hand's sweaty. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, everybody's introduced themselves. I, I'm not a PhD student or professor, just a struggling Jewish person who grew up in Israel. Um, tough times. Um, my question to you is actually, with, with your knowledge of... Um, with your studies, do you see examples maybe in the past of what you studied of how we find our way out of this? Any case studies, any lessons taken? Uh, you mentioned that um, no conflict has gone on this long in this context specifically. Um, why have they other conflicts been able to end earlier? And can we learn anything? Is, 
yeah, can we learn anything from, from the past to your knowledge? Thanks, and a final question here. Who? Hello, I am not a researcher. I'm Nikita Shabazi, and I used to write on this subject many years ago. Uh, what I really find here is that we are trying to come up with definitions, but we are trying to decouple definitions from the political vacuum and the space that are defining, defining them and influencing them. We are talking about anti-Semitism and that uh, it should be decoupled from Jewishness, but what Israel is doing in the media, it cannot uh, take away the people, the images that people have and the du judgments that people develop about a Jewish state or a nation state that is there to protect Jewishness. And I am really surprised because already in the second week of October, 800 scholars have been defining what is happening as a genocide, while it has been very difficult for you to accept this. And what we are also trying to say about Hamas and denying it as an anti-Semitic organization, even in Hamas has been growing in a political vacuum. Can you perhaps ask a question? Um, I think it is very necessary in order to take the political developments. Like in 2006, they had only 5,000 people supporting them in 20 times. They have been almost quadrupled, and they are much more stronger and are willing to do deadly attacks. So anti-Semitism cannot be taken away from the political uh, situation, the media, and the images that people are saying from them home. They should be, yeah. OK, no question, but a statement. Fine. But, uh, I would like to ask, uh, yeah. I mean, how do they want to how come up with the definition without not taking the political uh, developments at the background? Thanks. I think there are two questions that are perhaps possible both for you to answer. The first one, uh, sorry, the second question, but the first perhaps to answer comes back to the question, OK, you want to have these better definitions, mm -hmm. but why does it matter? And, and are you not actually then making it something into a vacuum instead of showing who's using which definition in daily reality? And the second question is about hope, I think, right? So that might be related. So do you see a way out? And then again, why then would it be helpful to have these better terms, okay. right? Yeah. For the two of you, please go ahead. I'm actually wondering uh, what definition of anti-Semitism you think would be useful. I have to get the mic. Well, this is why I'm here. This is why I want to know what would be useful for me. Yeah. They shot two. Okay. You're talking about the two definitions? Or maybe she has an alternate idea. No, no. No, okay. Um... Okay, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to respond because I, I think uh, what you're talking about is how the rise in anti-Semitism, the rise of Hamas is the result of um, a larger political context, right? And we have to pay attention to that political context and also blame that political context for what's happening. And during this political okay, let's, let's. occupation and the actions of Please the go ahead. I mean, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but I still think we need to um, address... I don't think that means we shouldn't address anti-Semitism when it arises. So I, it's the, I don't think these definitions operate outside of history, and they don't propose to operate outside of history. Um, I think these can still be useful. Um, actually in a weird way, the two questions in my answer are related to one another. Because um, Ariela Azulai's work on potential history is a great um, compass here because she looks at moments in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the history of it, not from perspectives on destruction, killing or, um, um, you know, territorial grab um, or attacks uh, that 
such as Hamas. Um, but from moments of negotiation that were once possible and in the end didn't happen. So actually the answer for your question, it was, it was there in the 1990s, there was a potential of peace. The fact that it didn't happen doesn't mean that it shouldn't have been. Or the fact that it didn't happen doesn't mean that potential history gets wiped out. That is why it's very, very important to look at moments of peace. The other question about um, Hamas being an outcome of all of, of all of this, it is factually correct. But does it really justify Hamas doing things that he is it, he is doing um, because it was an outcome? That would be my question to you. Would it justify for Hamas being an outcome of all of this to do what it is doing? Because in the end, also, the Palestinians in, Palestinians in Gaza, a few months before they, are not, they were not okay, with the Hamas as an establishment, as a government, but probably after October 7, they will be. All right, I propose here we stop. Um, I really like to thank uh, Eisenhower and Jessica very much for your contribution, actually in two ways. First, content-wise, I think we learned a lot, but also uh, the tone, the way you are discussing. I think this is actually uh, exemplary. This is the way we should discuss these kind of topics, even though it's very tough, right? It's very tough. But I think that the way you did it and that you showed your hesitations, how you're searching and researching, that's exactly the way that is also helpful and that deserves a lot of imitation in the outside world, I would say. Yeah. Thanks so much.